<laughs> Greetings to everybody. Hello. Uh, my name is Bermi Dizon and I serve as pastor here in uh, Glendora, Grace Communion International. Uh, my wife and I, including Jillian and Stephen, are really excited about this upcoming trip that is going to happen, hopefully, <laughs> uh, in, by June 15 to June 23, we're going to Israel, something that uh, I have dreamed of and looking forward to. And uh, whenever we plan for a trip, I'm sure you do the same thing, we have to take care of a lot of details, right, before we, we leave, before we go. Uh, for example, plans have to be made to make sure that someone takes care of the pets. We have our dog, Oreo. I said, Mark, please take care of our dogs. Make sure the dog doesn't poop in the living room, right? <laughs> Mark, my nephew, lives with us. Um, uh, somebody takes care of the flowers. You know, I like gardening and so forth. So we ask somebody to take care of them. Uh, maybe this time, not Mark, but somebody else. Take care of the mail, because you have mail coming in and you don't want the mailbox to be filled and people knowing you're gone. Um, and many more uh, matters of security, for example. Uh, hey, make sure, because it's going to be summer, it's hot. If somebody opens the window, make sure that the windows are, are closed. So we give those last minute instructions before leaving uh, for the trip. You know, those things have to be done. Now, Jesus Christ has been on earth for... How many? 33 years. And he had completed his earthly ministry uh, with the ministry that he did and by his death and by his resurrection. And then for, after the resurrection for 40 days, he felt he needed to take care of these last minute details before he ascended to heaven. And so I think we need to know some of what Jesus Christ said, some of the instructions he gave before he ascended to heaven. So let's go to Acts that was read by Janet Shea. Thank you, Janet. Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions, so there were instructions, you know, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And verse 3, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So I like putting things in an outline. So the first thing that we learn here, if I summarize, is that uh, Christ assures them of the reality of his resurrection. That's the first thing we learn here, that he assures them that resurrection did happen, that he didn't say dead. I mean, 40 days, can you believe that? Not only they saw him on that first day, but 40 days. Sometimes you wonder, why would Jesus decide to stay for 40 more days. Why didn't he just beam me up, Scotty, you know? <laughs> just go up there and chew, you know, back to heaven. But 40 days to really show to people, I'm alive, right? I rose from the dead. So he was giving them the assurance that there was the resurrection. It is a reality. Yeah, they saw him die. They were witnesses to the crucifixion, and they needed to know that he was alive. That is very important. It's also the same thing today. Today, we also need to hear Christ's assurance about his resurrection. We do need not only the early disciples, but us too. Do we really believe that Jesus is alive? That, you know, that Jesus, this man, this person, this divine being, has power over life and death. I mean, that's the reality of it, that, that Jesus is present and alive today. So that's the first thing we, we see here. He was really emphasizing that 
He, he was he is now today alive. So let's go to verses 6 and 7. Jump uh, to verses 6 and 7. Um, and then it says here, Then they, they, who? Disciples, the witnesses there. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And then in verse 7, and he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. All right, so isn't that interesting that they ask him about the kingdom of Israel? You know why? Because when we read the scriptures here, it says that even here, Christ spoke so much about this kingdom of God. When we look at the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there is so much about the kingdom of God that Christ spoke about. Unfortunately, they didn't really understand what that kingdom was about. But they were asking here, they were excited about uh, Jesus Christ rising and probably leading Israel in revolution against the Roman Empire. Is it now? You know, they were asking this question. So that's the, that's the, it's implied here. So the second lesson we, we learn here is that Christ teaches or taught the disciples about the priority of the kingdom of God in our lives. The kingdom, that is foremost in the teachings of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. Jesus taught constantly about the meaning of his kingdom. The disciples, you know, continued to misunderstand that. And Jesus wanted his followers to know what the kingdom of God is, as, you know, when you continue reading the story, they will begin to understand. In the same way, Christians, you and I, we need to keep our kingdom priorities in our lives. Seek you first, what does it say? Matthew 6, 33, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a lesson here. That that's a priority for us, us, not just the disciples, a priority for us. Kingdom of God is about, we talk about loving God, you know, we gather in worship, it's about loving others. You know, it's not a location or something that we just imagine as a place, but it is about loving God and winning the lost, edifying the saved, ministering to those who are outside the church. Because that's what God does. That's what Jesus does, serving people, serving the human needs. Jesus Christ, remember, died for people. He didn't die for you know, statement of beliefs or policies or rules or whatever, right? He died for people. That's how important it is. That's, and that is who he is as the king. So let's go on to verses 4 and 5 and also verse 8. Verses 4 and 5 and verse 8. So the lesson in these verses is that Christ predicts and he promises the power of God in our lives. Christ promises something. Christ understood that on our own, we cannot even imagine to accomplish the things that we need to do as Christians. So in verse 4 to 5, it says, On one occasion, while he was sitting with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, it's an instruction, but wait for the gift. My father promised, which you have heard me speak about. You know, in John, it mentioned, I'm going to send you the comforter. That was a promise Christ said. And then verse 5, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. You cannot do it on your own. As a Christian, you think you're going through a journey, this life? It's not easy. For those of us who are going through trials, who are going through suffering and pain, how much more difficulty going through this. And God knows that. That's why he's, he, he took care of it. He said, I, I have somebody. In verse 8, if you can jump to verse 8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So the Holy Spirit provides that much needed energy, you know, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
So there is that promise. So as soon as Jesus ascended, his, you know, as soon as he ascended, his ministry would be given to the disciples. He was giving them assignment to be witnesses to the disciples. So whatever Jesus had done, the same work of saving, helping, you know, that work that Christ continues to do was given to the disciples. Jesus promised his followers that they would not do this, this ministry, that they will not be able to accomplish this using their own human strength, using their own human reasoning and intelligence. Not that, but it's only through the Spirit of God. And um, Jesus knew and he understood. He knows you. He knows me. How challenging, how challenging and difficult the work can be. We look at ourselves and we see, whoa, our inadequacy, our lack of ability, you know, our lack of influence. There's so much that we feel maybe inferior about. The good thing about it is God knows that. He understands that. Don't be afraid. He understands that. That's why he's, he does something. He sends us help. He knew those things. And he, God, does not expect us to do this work using our own strength. He does not expect us to provide for something we don't really have. You know, the work that is done is much more the work of Jesus. But God is so good, he invites us to participate. So he gave us his Holy Spirit. So we are called to serve God. I mean, there is this mission how? We are called to serve God. How? Where he said this how is to be witnesses. What is a witness? You know, in the courts of law, a witness is one who gives a testimony. A testimony to what they have seen or maybe experienced and gives that testimony. That's what it is. To be able to declare, to declare to people what we have seen, what we have experienced, having come to know Jesus Christ and having come to experience Christ living in us. A witness is the one who gives a testimony. That's, that's us. That's our work as Christians. And in addition to that, God says, Christ said, you have power to do it. We are called to a mission, a holy mission, and we have the Spirit of God. What could be much better? Well, we have the third person. We have God himself. You know, we have the Holy Spirit. I mean, that to me is amazing. So that's the third one. There's a promise. Christ promised before he ascended, before he rose. Don't you worry. I have somebody for you. I have the Spirit. I have, you know, this is power. Uh, if you're still feeling weak, if you're still feeling inadequate and you can't do this, this is just so overwhelming, go back to this verse. And God says, you're not alone. I understand what you're going through. There is power. There is power for you. Then let's go to verse 9. Verse 9, here it, uh, Christ tells us that he, in a way he said, mission accomplished. Um, Verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So this scripture said that you know, he ascended. Jesus would, would have never left earth if his mission was not accomplished. Remember when he was on the cross, right? Remember that word that we use, that Greek word, it says tetelestai. That's a Greek word meaning it is finished. That work, you know, when he was flesh and blood at that time before his crucifixion, at that time he said, it is finished. Mission accomplished. So the fact that he ascended back to the Father testified that everything necessary for uh, the human need for reconciliation was completed. It was accomplished. So think about that for a moment. It was accomplished. The work of salvation belonged to Jesus. It was accomplished. Think about that. It was accomplished. Done. Deal. So when we, sometimes we think about it, when we 
work hard. I have to work hard. When we work hard to earn our salvation, I need to do I need to work hard to earn the salvation. In many ways, that tells Jesus that we disregard and in some ways disrespect uh, what Jesus has already accomplished. In a way, it's like saying, uh, Lord Jesus, what you have done, what you have accomplished is not enough. I need to help you. I need to do something. In a way, that's what we said. It's like, okay, incomplete work, Jesus. I need to help, help you. I need to work you know, to earn salvation. But no, we, it is not. It is Christ who did it. So believers do not have to work to complete their salvation. Christ is the one that completed that on the cross. And uh, so therefore, we yield to Christ's completed work. And of course, a continuing, continuing work that he did, he's doing. Uh, we'll go through that a bit more. So number five, on verses 10 and 11, this is very encouraging. Verses 10 and 11, which is Christ promises. Um, in fact, there were angels that were sent, these aliens, you know, from outer space or so another dimension. I mean, this is more like, you know, I love Star Trek. You know, that's me. I love Star Wars. I like Star Trek, a lot of sci-fi movies. That's, sorry, but that's me. You know, I... Uh, when I was in the Philippines before coming to the USA, there was a time I got a little depressed. You know, I went to this bookstore in Davao City, and I saw on sale this Star Trek books on sale. And I bought them, 40. It's amazing they were even exactly 40. 40 Star Trek books <laughs> that I bought, and I read them all, you know, all this, uh, that time of my, you know, those, those were during the time of the changes. Well, so this is this is like sci-fi, you know. This whoa, this person rising up, and then this alien beings appearing. In verse ten, it says they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. So they were seeing Jesus as he was going. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Poof! <laughs> two men dressed in white. Who, who, you know. Uh, Man, verse 11, men of Galilee, I'm sure there were women there too, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? That must be an amazing sight. <laughs> looking into the sky, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. They were looking, oh, bye-bye, goodbye, you know, like departure. And, and this angel said, you don't get it, you know. Christ's coming back. As soon as he ascended, these messengers came and probably they were stunned. You know, I would be these disciples. They probably were disappointed that he didn't restore back the kingdom of Israel, right? They were probably lonely that this friend of them, of theirs, uh, is leaving. That's why the angels came and says, you don't, have, don't be afraid. Don't be lonely. He's coming back. So they told them that Jesus would come again. So who told the messengers? Of course, you know, God sent the messengers and he, he promises a future return. That's, that's a promise. That's a promise. And, you know, we Christians for centuries live in this hope of Christ coming back. That is a hope that we have. You know, during the Second World War, at the beginning of the Second World War in the Philippines, uh, the Philippine guerrillas and army were losing against the Japanese imperial forces. And the Americans were there, and they have to retreat. You know, the fall of Bataan, you know, if you hear that. And the, one of the generals, the famous General Douglas MacArthur, before he left, he said this one sentence, I shall return. That statement got stuck into the minds and brains of those guerrillas, these uh, people. There was a promise he will return and gave them strength and gave them hope that there's going to be a liberation that's going to come. 
And a lot of, you know, I hear it even from my parents. They were looking forward to a liberation. And MacArthur, you know, did that. And he came back. You know, he arrived back in the Philippines in Leyte Island. And he came back. And, of course, that changed the history and the liberation, not only of the Philippines, but all the other neighboring nations that were at that time attacked by the Japanese imperial forces. So that's a promise. The return of Jesus Christ. Sixth one is the one that I want to emphasize, number six, and that is humanity ascended with him. Now, that might be a, some, something new to our thinking. Jesus wanted people to see that, first, he did not shed his humanity, his being human. Like, humanity is not, it's not like a clothes that you wear, and afterwards, okay, bye-bye, you remove, you know, no. Uh, he showed, that's why he took 40 days. Why will that be? Why will Jesus stay for 40 days as flesh and blood? In fact, he says, okay, Thomas, touch my you know, nail scars here. Okay, touch this pierce in my you know, chest here. When Jesus really wanted to show that Jesus was fully human, fully divine, fully God. That he was human after the resurrection. That's why he took all that time, 40 days. He showed himself to the disciples. He showed Thomas, the one who doubted. He showed his disciples going to Emmaus Road. He showed the, the ladies, you know, during the resurrection day. He appeared to many people. It says in scriptures, probably 500 people saw it and witnessed that. And for 40 days, probably there's many more. And when he ascended to the heavens, that same Jesus with the same body, human body, rose. You know, I don't, I don't think Christ rose like a, quickly gone. Probably he took this dramatic, rising slowly <laughs> to show, you know. I don't know if there was a choir of angels singing, but it didn't say in the Bible, I mean the Bible, nothing there. But I think it took time for people to see that that same Jesus, you know. So Jesus is fully human and fully God. 100% human, 100% God. So why is the ascension important? That's a question we ask. I ask that question because we live in a world which, for us, up is better than down. You know, going up is better than down. Singers want to be on top of the charts. Singers, actors, and so forth. Athletes want to be on the top of their game. Students want to be on top of their classmates. Everyone would rather have an up day than a down day. I mean, you agree? You want to have an up day, not a down day. When the stock market rises up, all those who have 401k and 403b or whatever investments, hey, they're rejoicing, they're happy. But when the stock market crashes down, people are depressed, you know. The mood also gets depressed, right? So no one wants to be at the bottom of someone's list. So we work hard. We work hard to climb not to descend the career ladder. We want to get promoted up. That's what we are. We hear and we read about, oh, you know, Sir Hillary who climbed Mount Everest, you know, the highest mountain. Uh, do we hear anybody who went down the lowest valley? <laughs> That's not. We, we don't celebrate the one, oh, you went to the lowest valley. No, it's the mountain that we, we hear about these climbers and we say, whoa, we celebrate with them. So the reality is that it is our nature. We want to live going up. We want ascension ourselves. We want to have this ascended life, meaning a life that goes up. We want to break free from the things that hold us down and want us to rise above it all. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I think we are built that way. In fact, that's all right. You know, it's, in fact, it is, it's okay to rise. We, we, we do that. But something within us knows that we are, we, we are more than earthbound. Being just earthbound on earth. There, there's something that God put in us that 
we want something more than this reality. You know, something, something more. We look forward to, for that. But this can be a problem. And I will explain what, what that is. This can be a problem. The problem is when we are so much into wanting to rise up. You know, we, we can get this distortion of what ascension of Jesus really mean, what that is. That, you know, this distortion thinking that Jesus rose to the highest dimension and we are separate from him. That he is far away from us. And so therefore we need to, do, I mean, Jillian talked about it last week, about we want to strive hard, right? We want to do something. Uh, we forget or perhaps deny that Christ's ascension seats humanity next to God, where Jesus is. The ascension of Jesus made possible us sitting next to him. Let's go to Ephesians 2, verse 6. This is an amazing, when I first read this scripture, kind of boggles my mind. Ephesians 2, verse 6. It says, And God raised us up with Christ. Think about that. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. I mean, wow. And God raised us up with Christ. Raised is, is past tense here. And seated us, seated again past, it's, it's been done. The ascension of Jesus made possible our ascending in a spiritual way. You know, the reality of life is more than just this physical body that we see ourselves. There is more to it. But the distortion, you know, that has invaded our theology and understanding of God, that's, that is there. And so people don't understand that Christ has accomplished that. And so we think this, this theology of we are separated and far away and we want to do our part, do our best and work hard. In this distorted view, you know, God, heaven and holiness are up there, like up there so far away and we are stuck here on earth. So we spend time, you know, because of this wrong theology, we spend time trying to jump, you know, jump up and down like little children thinking that maybe if I jump high enough, maybe if I work hard enough, I can grab hold of the heavens. I, I can touch the moon. <laughs> you know, maybe if I did that, like the people who built the Tower of Babel, like Lucifer who said, I will ascend into the heavens. You know, there's this, this desire. And when we have that kind of wrong theology, uh, we live it in many ways. It affects us. It, 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 it almost involves us always comparing you know, ourselves with other people and maybe judging others. Uh, we compare ourselves with other people and with their lives uh, we compete. We, you know, when that is the case of trying to do something, trying to work hard, we compete with each other, believing that, that for us to ascend, for us to go up, the others must descend, must go down. You know, there's this competition of trying to fight it out. Uh, but that's not what the ascension of Jesus, you know, we, where we, when we have this wrong theology, we work so hard uh, we worry. We're messed up in our thinking. We're not happy. We, we are always stressed because we don't measure up. You know, God is so far away. So we are forever judging ourselves and judging one another. And so we fill our lives with busyness, hoping to climb to the new heights, hoping to climb higher so a life of self-ascension, let us call it self-ascension, where it is us trying to rise up on our own strength, a life of self-ascension keeps us always searching for the next high because you never feel like you attain it. I need to, I need to, I need to go higher and higher 
and then we get burned out. We get depressed because we are not able to do it. And that separates us. The creation, you and I, are separated from the creator, that perspective. And it destroys relationships with God and with fellow people and, and intimacy. Uh, that's what happens. So the disciples probably were looking at Jesus and they were feeling kind of the same thing. He is rising up. Our, our commander, our leader is leaving us. Good, is it a goodbye and all of this? But that's not what the ascension is about. That, that is something that God, I think, wants us to, to, to understand that the ascension of Jesus is not about the absence of Jesus, but it is about the presence of Jesus through his spirit living in us. That's what it is. It is not a goodbye. When he was ascending to heaven, you know, he, it's, that's not a goodbye. He said, I will send you the Holy Spirit. It is actually, I am there with you with his spirit. So that's, that's the case. So Jesus' ascension, this why it's important, the ascension of Jesus, because it corrects, it reshapes the transfigured idea, uh, the understanding of what an ascended life is all about. Because that is a wrong concept the people may have about, you know, I mean, most other religions, Asian religions, it's Hindu, Buddhist, Shinto, whatever. It's all about trying hard to go up the ladder. It's not what Christ teaches. Jesus' ascension corrects this disfigured understanding of ascended life. Jesus is the only authentic understanding of what ascended life is all about. Because we all want to be ascended, rise up. Jesus is the one. So through Jesus, we too can live this ascended life, meaning going up. So do you want to have an ascended life? Only through Jesus Christ. That's how it can be. Jesus' ascension is not about, the, about his absence. It's not a goodbye. That's why it's important. A lot of times we talk about the crucifixion, the resurrection, and we brush aside the ascension, but this really matters. It's important that he, was, he is fully human and fully God, so we, there's this new humanity. Because we are in Christ. If you go and Google the phrase in Christ, you will see dozens and dozens of, there's so much about being in Christ, our identity in him. There's so much, a lot, a lot of that. So through Jesus, we can live this ascended life. It's not about his absence, but it is the truth about his presence. It is the truth about his presence. It's not about his leaving, but about the fullness of him in us. When he ascended, he sent his spirit to us. So there is not like separation, but there is now fullness of Jesus in us because he ascended, he is sitting with, his, with the Father. Yes, you know, the ascension of Jesus completes the resurrection. Yes, the resurrection is victory over death. The ascension, however, lifts up humanity with Jesus in the heavens. As I read a while ago, we are seated with, in, with Christ. So it's about humanity rising, ascending, because we are in Christ. That's what Christ took. The ascension, that's what it is. It is humanity going up, ascension. Um, uh, for some, this, it might be a new concept, but that's what the scriptures is. In fact, Peter himself mentioned, what did Peter say? For we are now partakers of the divine nature of God. It's in Peter. I don't have to turn there, but that you can search that. That we are partakers of the divine nature of God. You know what that means? That means... Whoa, that means a lot. We are partakers of the divine nature. That's, that's who we are. You know, you feel sad, you feel depressed, you feel like inadequate. <laughs> the Bible says, you are a new creation. You are a new humanity. You are seated in the heavenly thrones because you are in Christ. So the question for us is not 
How can I ascend? How can I rise up? How do we ascend? That's not the question because Jesus Christ has already accomplished that. Our ascension has been accomplished by Jesus Christ. The question we should ask should be, what pulls us down? What pulls, what gravity, what pulls us down? What do we need to let go of? Because there are things that sometimes we would experience that will always pull us down. Maybe fear. Maybe you have this deep-seated anger. Maybe some kind of resentment that weighs us down. Self-righteousness, maybe. Or the need to be in control. I mean, those are heavy burden. Those are forces of weight that can pull you down when Jesus Christ has already accomplished ascending and taking us with him. So many of us will be caught in this chain of striving hard, striving hard to, to measure up. So what forces deny us from living this ascended life? Because as a Christian, you have it. You have ascended life. So what brings us down? I mean, that's something to think about. Just remember that our participation in Jesus' ascension begins not by trying our best to go up, but it is in looking within us the presence of Jesus Christ, the very life and presence of the ascended Jesus. The ascended Jesus Christ is in us. So look within, look within you and see Jesus Christ. Because that's what the scriptures say, that he lives in us. <clears throat> so for me, the ascension emphasized that Jesus Christ's departure is not bye-bye, it's not the end or the conclusion, but only the beginning. That, that's the beginning of another chapter, the start of the creation of a worldwide mission and witness through the church in the power of the Holy Spirit. He gave us a purpose in this life. And as for the, those apostles at that moment, just like them, it is a call for us today to be witnesses. That's what Acts 1 verse 8 says. To be witnesses, to proclaim, and to live. Because to be a witness is not just to proclaim, but to live the good news through the Holy Spirit right now, right here, right in this building, right among us. God is not up there in so far away, distant distance. Christ our Lord is here, right here, immediately, immediately present now in us. Acts 1 verse 8, notice, I think this is a good message for us to review. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the life that we have. We will be witnesses. My friends, Jesus has not gone away. He's not gone. He has, through his Spirit, has gone deeper, deeper into the heart of reality, our reality as children of God. Christ went deeper in us, more intimacy. When he ascended to heaven, he said, I will send you the Spirit. And through that Spirit, he lives in us. So he is present, our reality and God's reality. He is in us and we are in him. He has become much more than just the visible friend and companion. He has shown himself to be the very center. He is the very center of our life. He is the source of our energy to, to go to God in worship, you know, hoping for answers. That's, that's where we draw that desire for worship and all that. And that's where we draw energy so that we can edify and build one another and love each other. That's where we draw energy from 
loving the world and, and serving the world and in worship, in prayers, and trusting, and, and also excited and waiting for the kingdom of God to be established, you know, so that the whole world will, will change. So the ascension shows that all humanity is welcome. It's welcome into the very heart of God. That's, that to me is amazing. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, we uh, thank you so very much for showing to us that <laughs> what a joy it is, Lord, that we can understand through your scriptures what the ascension of Jesus truly means, Lord. There's so much, but more importantly, Lord, you tell us that because Jesus Christ is fully human and fully God, he has taken humanity with him, Lord God, and we are in Christ. Also, thank you, God. <laughs> Thank you so much for this promise that, uh, Lord, that we can rejoice in that, that we don't have to strive hard, work our own salvation, Lord, but be happy that you have ascended and your ascension has assured your presence in each of us today. And for those who are suffering and for those who are in pain, be encouraged that you understand that and you have given us the spirit of encouragement in these times of difficulties. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.